Welcome to Petability. I'm your host, Kathy Simons. And I'm your host, Chris Cranston. Our podcast provides interviews and information to help your pets live their best lives. Good day, Kathy. Hello, Chris. It's nice to see your face today. Always good to see your face, Kathy. Thank you. Very, very happy about the guests that we have today, Lori Levine. Yes, I think this is a very um, important topic for owners that we're going to be discussing today. We are going to be discussing the process of grieving, grieving our pet. For our listeners, let me give you a little bit of background on Lori. Lori Levine is a licensed mental health care counselor with over 34 years experience. Um, Lori's practice is dedicated uh, to pet loss, grief counseling and caregiver support. And, um, you know, in, in Lori's own words, and I found this, uh, th- this particularly powerful when she said this, because I can really, I really can understand this, that grieving the loss of an animal companion can be especially lonely in our culture and, and our grief may not be recognized or understood by the people around us or our relationship with that pet may not be understood. Um, and that can make it difficult to move forward with that and to, to share. Um, so Lori provides that safe space for you to talk about um, not only loss, um, that grieving, um, but also perhaps even that anticipate, anticipatory loss that, that we know that we're, we're coming to the end of our pet's lives and how do we deal with that and how do we move forward? So um, welcome, Lori. Welcome, Lori. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to have you on this show. It's such an important topic to, to discuss with, with owners. Um, so thank you for being here. For sure. Or can you expound a little bit on your journey and how you got here in this particular niche? Uh, sure. Frankly, yeah, before I met you at uh, Sleepy Dog Veterinary, um, I, I never really thought of a professional providing these services for our, our pet owner. So mm-hmm. I, I am so honored to know you and, and that we have you in our, our local community. So yeah, please, please do tell. Sure, sure. Well, you know, it is a nascent field, so um, your experience is that of many people because uh, those of us who are providing grief counseling as well as those who are grieving are actually creating the field as we do it. Um, But for me, um, I was born into a family where the first child was a Jack Russell Terrier, so I've always lived with cats and dogs. And uh, my mother was an animal rights activist. And I just always had a curiosity about death and dying. I remember uh, as a child reading the obituaries in the newspaper. Um, And then, you know, I had my own human and animal losses along the way. I ended up uh, going to school for counseling psychology and working primarily in a public school with children and families. And besides from pet loss, there were, you know, a lot of other losses that were a part of that, Uh, you know, losing other family members to illness or separations, as well as community violence. And then I started uh, volunteering at one of the MSPCA adoption centers. And there were so many of these just small moments of grief support. Uh, For example, somebody would have just picked up the ashes of her loved one and she would come through to see who might be up for adoption and trying to figure out if she was ready or not to adopt. And there's another woman who came in and she saw someone who looked just like her loved one who had just passed and she just burst into tears and said, well, I thought I was over it. And so there were just so many of these moments that really moved me that, you know, we're all grappling with this and it's part of our love for animals. And um, it made me feel like I just really want to um, be a part of the, these kinds of supports and healing processes. And, and I've been fortunate enough to uh, be part of the sleepy dog team. So here I am. And yes, and we're so fortunate to have you close by in our community. So, so that's awesome. And, you know, Kathy said this is such an important topic. And, 
And uh, I certainly agree. And I think any of us who have loved a pet, you know, unless you happen to be a brand new pet owner, has experienced this loss personally. You know, you alluded to that, Lori, and I know Kathy and I both have. And so it is a very different topic that affects all of us at some point. And, you know, I think it's important to understand not only our own feelings around this, but how we can support others who may be going through this, you know, whether it's end of life decisions or, or the actual loss of their pet. Mm -hmm. you, you know, pets have, uh, they play such a important role in our lives. And, you know, many pets have seen many people through certainly different stages in their lives. Sometimes pets have seen mm -hmm. us through marriages, divorces, birth of mm -hmm. children, sicknesses or, or other deaths. So, um, you know, there are probably some people out there that, that might even be closer to their pet than any other human on the planet. So I, I want, you know, our owners to understand that, you know, their grief is, is real and, and they, and I want to make sure that people understand that um, it's normal, you know, it's normal to grieve your pet. That's okay. And that's right. And, you know, sometimes, you know, people will tell me how, you know, they've, they, why are they grieving more over their animal companion than their parent? And, you know, it, 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 it's along with what you're both saying, it, it's such a, it can be a very different relationship than with a human. A lot of it is nonverbal. Um, it's unconditional love. Um, it, they're always home. <laughs> you know, it's a very, very physical relationship. A lot is understood that doesn't have to be mediated by language that, you know, can kind of become, you know, so complicated with other humans. So it's, it's also the nature of that relationship that, you know, also becomes why we grieve so much. I remember one of my uh, very best friends, um, we met in college, and years later we reconnected and, and she shared that um, she had recently lost one of her pets. She had many. And, you know, I was supportive and, and so forth, but then she said, dog's name was Bentley. Uh, she said, I've had a relationship with him longer than anybody else in my life, except mm. my family, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of just, just longevity. You know, he lived to be like, mm -hmm. she never had a romantic relationship or a friendship or, you know, whatever that had been, you know, that long and, and, uh, or, or as intense probably. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Exactly. And that, that just really right. struck me. That was the first time, this is before I worked with pets, you know, it was years ago and I mm -hmm. heard being struck by that. Certainly. Or is there something, mm -hmm. you know, we've, we've been experiencing, um, this pandemic, uh, around the world. And, um, is there something that is especially, unsettling during this time when people are experiencing grief? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think that, you know, for people who may have been, you know, their animal companion may be or may have been their closest relationship, uh, losing them now really makes it so much harder to have other supports and connections that, you know, many of us are more isolated in general from other humans. And so if you don't have those humans in your life, it can feel even more lonely. And, you know, we're a culture that in general does have difficulty grieving. And now, you know, with a pandemic, we're being faced with it. But people tend to think of a hierarchy of grief and loss, and there really is no hierarchy. It's about having a broken heart, and it's about loving and being loved. And so I think, you know, now and, and, and even, you know, not in a pandemic, a lot of people who lose their animal companions feel that their loss is invisible or it doesn't count enough. It's called a disenfranchised loss and that compounds the the grief and it compounds the pain and the loneliness or you know just someone who you know that maybe another human that they're close to has trying to help but but says something like well it was just a dog you know or it was just mm -hmm. your cat um 
and maybe they're trying to be helpful in that moment, but it's, you're right. It makes them feel like they can't express their grief for their pet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. You know, right. In preparation for this, this chat today, I just Google grief as a definition. I want to know what came up and it was a very succinct definition. Uh, the first one that came up and it said deep sorrow, especially that caused by someone's death. And I was struck mm. because, you know, I think that we can grieve many things. We can grieve, you know, certainly people, we can grieve our pets. We can grieve other things like relationships or loss of, of job and, and that sort of thing. Would you agree with that? You know, speaking to the hierarchy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For sure. Right. So I thought that was kind of a and, narrow definition. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, one, one definition that I've read and it was an anonymous source. So I wish I knew who said it was grief is love with nowhere to go. And I think of that, mm-hmm. you know, with the people I meet with that, you know, and for myself, I'm still loving, you know, those animal companions that have passed on, you know, I still have a relationship with them and, you know, but it's not in the way that, we were able to to be in life together. And so I think that, you know, it's, if we can see it as kind of the other side of love, I think it helps us to understand why we feel so bad. And that in time, the, the feeling of love that we're used to does prevail. And I've seen that with so many people that, you know, right after the death, or at the end of life, you know, it's the sorrow and the pain and the heartache that prevail. But in time, you know, the, the, the feeling of love that we're used to, the joy, the being tickled by their antics, the comfort, those do prevail. And I, and I think that's all part of the process of going through grieving. Mm-hmm. Lori, do you feel that, that, that people go through the, the five stages of grief. You know, we, we all heard about that when it became so um, mm-hmm. well-known and, and things. So again, those are denial, um, kind of that shock, and then the anger, you know, how could they leave us? And then the bargaining, depression, and then finally the acceptance, which I think you're kind of alluding mm-hmm. to, you know, the, the prevailing of, of love and remembering those, those happy times. Do you feel that that applies to our animal companions as well? Mm-hmm. I feel like those are all in components and it was very important that those were identified uh, many years ago, but I don't see it. And I, I don't, you know, from what I have been able to witness with other people, it's not a linear process. Mm-hmm. And so I think those are all com- components, but it's not about kind of completion or mastery of one stage leads to another. And I have found more people describing grief as a journey uh, where, you know, you can't see or know everything from the beginning, but it's kind of like when you adopt someone and bring them into your life. Um, I mean, it's a different feeling about it, but it is a journey and all those uh, emotions and, and stages are uh, often a part of it, but, you know, we could be feeling really resolved one day and then see, you know, uh, the tale of somebody who reminds right. us of who we've lost and all of a sudden it's like it's raw again. And so I, I see it as more of like a process of integration over time and adjusting um, and kind of catching up internally with what has changed for us externally. I'd like to uh, I'd like to ask you a question about the feeling of uh, you know often owners will express to me right after their pet dies and we don't discuss it this very often but there's a sense of relief you know initially mm-hmm. right and then that's followed by a wave of guilt this feeling mm-hmm. that you feel guilty because you felt some relief after the pet died. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I I think that's a very normal reaction. I don't think that, you know, Mm -hmm. the relief actually comes necessarily in in thinking that, oh, you know, my pet's gone. It's more like a, I know they're, I I don't have to worry about them anymore. Suffering has I don't have Mm -hmm. to worry about their suffering. I don't have to, you know, my first dog passed, 
and he was thir- almost 14, I would wake up every morning at 4.30 because he wanted to go to the bathroom at 4.30. And for a month after that, I would like shoot up at 4, 4 4.30 in the morning and go, yeah. oh my gosh, I forgot yeah. to take him out, right? And and he was, yeah, fast, right? So that that feeling, but but I think that the relief is a normal reaction. Would you agree? Yes, it is. And when you think of, you know, often if it's, uh, you know, a, a medical situation and, and there's end of life care, how, you know, intense it gets, there's changes happen very rapidly. We're constantly being having to make uh, end of life care decisions. Uh, often there's no clear best decision and there's you know, many factors involved and we're exhausted and, and we see the change in the quality of our loved one's life. You know, we see that they're more withdrawn. We see that they're not so eager to eat and things like that. Their mobility, you know, may be changed. Their bathroom habits may be changed. So, you know, we know that, you know, that they're not as comfortable and carefree as they once were. So, you know, I think it's normal to feel relief. And, and I think that's part of knowing that, you know, we do have this choice to aid their dying and that's something that we can give them. But the guilt too is part of grieving. I mean, I, I have learned from my clients that, you know, it, it is actually a part of grieving. And I, I think that, you know, we often latch on to one thing that stands out for us, but then people will say to me, yeah, if it wasn't that, I'd be feeling guilty over something else, <laughs> you know? And so it kind of shows us that, you know, I, I, I think it's a way to, while we're processing, you know, the letting go, when you think of it, if we've been so involved their whole lives and then even more vigilant and more intensely involved at the end of life, then it's hard to let go of that kind of control, right? It's hard to let go of that intensive caregiving. And so a guilt is a way that it's just a way the mind works to think like, okay, I could have controlled it. I could have done it differently. And I, you know, I see that in talking it through and thinking it through that people are able to have more peace about that over time. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that the circumstances are always a little bit different too. So there, there are sometimes, you know, animals die suddenly and that that's taken out Mm -hmm. of your hands and you don't have to make any decisions. And sometimes there's this long, you know, uh, a prolonged process of of decline. And I think I, I, I was reading, I read a book many years ago by Edward Myers called, um, when a parent dies and he uh-huh. had a quote in there that was very, very uh, powerful for me. And what he said was if sudden death hits like an explosion, knocking you uh-huh. flat, knocking you flat, then a slow decline arrives like a glacier, massive, uh-huh. unstoppable and grinding you uh-huh. down. So I think, again, you're right. I think that's where the relief comes from, you know, and I don't think we should feel guilty about that relief, but, but I think it's natural uh-huh. to follow the, the feeling of relief with guilt. We love to feel uh-huh, guilty. We love uh-huh. to feel guilty about something. <laughs> right. And and I think we have to allow ourselves to be human. And, you know, sometimes that's hard. We want to be superhuman. And and I think that, you know, when I talk with people, of course those and you know, towards the end of the life, whether it was a sudden death, whether it was a, a, a tragic accident or you know, a medical decline, you know, you know, for me and for them, those last images and those last situations are what are paramount in our memory. And then if over time, you know, we look at their whole life, like I often say to clients, like, okay, for a moment, think of, you know, your cat thinking back on their life and the life that you gave them. It's like, wow, that was a darn good life, you know, (laughs) and so it, you know, but it takes time to let go because it's almost like a shock or, you know, almost like a little bit of a trauma, that intensity Mm -hmm. of, of losing someone you love and who you've parented, who you've cared for and and may have been your closest companion. Um, But, you know, so it, it does help, you know, I think to have that perspective of looking at the whole life over mm-hmm. time. That's a, that's a great perspective. You're right. You know, I, I lost my 
other my dog uh, maybe about a year and a half almost two years ago and um we adopted him he was about six years old when we adopted him and he was blind and we had him for about four years and i would have we had had him you know much much longer and um it was it was it was very it was very difficult sometimes i'd find myself breaking down in the grocery store like at the deli section you know where i get him turkey that's where i find myself breaking down oh yes of course but, but if i look at his life as the whole in that four years that we had him it was really good it was really yeah. good he yeah. had so much joy um and, yeah. and just enjoyed new new experiences and new things and i think that we what we added to his life was was amazing so yeah eventually you're right eventually it sort of came to the point where the grief grief was and the sadness was a little less and the happy memories were more mm. yeah and what a lucky dog huh oh he was so great Laurie. i loved him yeah. <laughs> With my own pets, um, I've, I've certainly experienced both uh, sudden unexpected loss and chronic illness um, due to cancer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having to make that decision when it's time, you know, which is always tough. And I remember resenting people for saying things like, well, at least they didn't suffer for the two, it was a cat at one point and a dog at another point that died suddenly, unexpected. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I resented that. I'm like, you know, that, that was not comforting to me. Um, and I, I really tried to explore what I was feeling. And I know I was, I was feeling robbed of the chance to say goodbye. Yeah. And, you know, so I don't think there's any good way, um, you know, for our pets to go. Um, I think both have scenarios have their pros and cons mm -hmm. but it's it's hard no matter what yeah. so mm -hmm. yeah you know and it i mean this might seem like an odd thing to say but you know it made me think as a veterinary technician you know i want your dog to have a good death does that make sense i want them to have mm -hmm. an, easy, an easy passing um and and I want to try whatever whatever we can do to make that passing because I think the end of your pet's life is is equally as important as the very beginning, um, and so you know I I hope that you guys understand what I'm saying. I, I, when mm -hmm. I want, mm -hmm. um, you know, as a technician, I could say you know, maybe maybe there's a thought that that death is the worst thing or the worst thing mm. that could possibly happen. But as a technician, mm -hmm. I, you know, certainly I can tell you that there are worse things than mm -hmm. death. Um, and so I want your pet to have a peaceful passing, you know, and sometimes right. we do everything we can to, to make that happen. You know, we, we do what we can to make that happen, but I hope that doesn't sound out of strange, but <laughs> no, I, I think I've heard some things like on NPR and such too, about, you know, how we're, we're trying to do that more as a society, even mm -hmm. for people, you know, a good death, right? Yeah. Yeah. So again, mm -hmm. having the processing and, you know, closure of relationships and, comfort, you know, as, as things are going, I, when I took my, um, my previous Cavalier to a, a nursing home, um, there was a gentleman there and, and, you know, I'd seen him several times and, and then he looked really good when I came this one day and, and I'm like, you know, Ed, what's, what's going on? Why do you look so good? Your skin's all aglow. <laughs> and he says, oh, they're <laughs> preparing me to die. And I was just like, what? Uh, excuse me. Uh -huh. <laughs> so now, you uh -huh. know, somebody was coming in. They were, you know, lathering him with lotion and, mm -hmm. you know, doing all these little things to make him yeah. feel yeah. supported and as comfortable as possible, you know, as as he knew his life was waning. And, and I transition. think, yeah, I think that kind of speaks to your point, Kathy, with our pets, too, that we want to mm -hmm. ensure, you know, that and. And, you know, we have that ability with euthanasia, which is, mm -hmm. I think, you know, the, the final act of kindness, you know, the, the responsibility mm -hmm. that we're given. And I, I've never heard anybody in, in all my years say, you know, I, I think that I, I put my pet to sleep too soon. It was always the converse, you know, after some time, after some looking back in hindsight that maybe they shared no, now that I think about it, I think I may have kept them around too long. You know, it was for mm -hmm. me. Um, mm -hmm. But there, you know, that line moves all the time, all the time. Mm -hmm. So, 
Yeah. And it is such a responsibility. And, you know, I, I talk with people that, you know, really most of the time there really isn't a just one right moment. Uh, and even if there was, we may not have the provider available at that moment. Right. Um, and it's kind of more looking maybe in broader brushstrokes at the quality of their life and what we're able to sustain and to know that, you know, if we choose, we can give them this gift and to try and have some peace with it. Because I think there's a myth that there is the right time. And if you don't hit it right, then you've done something wrong. And and people often feel guilt about that. That's a really good point. I think you're right. I think they're looking for that one window and or that one moment in time. And you can't always capture it because your vet might not be available or for Mm -hmm. whatever reason you can't capture it. That doesn't mean that, you know, you know, two hours later uh, is the right time or not the right time. That line changes. Mm -hmm. Just like you said, the line changes, you know. And I've, I've had some people come to that decision, you know, mm-hmm. convinced that it's the right time. You know, tomorrow's going to be the day. Mm-hmm. Tomorrow comes mm-hmm. and their pet has rallied. They get yeah. they stand up yeah. on their own. Right. They ate a good breakfast, you know. And what I've tried to tell with the, to those people when I've had opportunity is that may have been true that morning. But you know, let's look at the overall pattern, right? Were there more mm-hmm. bad days than good days? And what's the difference between one day, one week, one month, you know, in the, in the right. whole life of the, right. of the pet? You know, in right. general, we know. We know that, you know, it's their time is coming. And again, finding that right time is, is very, very, very difficult. So, yeah. And, and- And also, you know, when people really can think about it, and often it's helpful to have somebody else to offer a sounding board, like, wouldn't you have preferred your loved one to have their favoritist meal and be able to eat it on their last day, you know, and and, and for you to have that memory? Um, You know, so, yeah, I mean, that's important to look at all that. I think uh, when Digger passed, he, he actually, he was, had a, he was doing really well up until the last couple of days before he passed. And that morning he got up and he had uh, yogurt, um, I think yogurt, <laughs> watermelon, and I can't remember what else, his favorite scrambled eggs. Right? I love it. And, and it was great. And um, he had rallied that morning and we went out for a walk and he sniffed the grass and he smelled the air. And then he came back in and he collapsed and both my husband and I were home, mm. you know, and, and, you know, in hindsight, I go, well, this, this actually couldn't have been, I couldn't have asked for anything more. We were both there. Yeah. He had his favorite breakfast. He had his favorite thing, which was mostly to go outside and pee on stuff, but still it was his uh-huh. favorite thing. <laughs> right. Got to sniff the fresh air. Um, so, you know, you know, in hindsight, I go, it's not a traumatic memory. It's, it was almost a, it was almost a gift in a sense, you know, that we got everything yeah. we had wanted. Yeah. yeah. Got everything we right. asked for. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's okay to have that too. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah and it kind of brings me to you know thinking about the sudden passing of my own dog, and and uh, you know I thought about those things like well when it's time for her to go because she was sick when I took her into my home, so I knew she wasn't long for this world. But I certainly didn't think that I was going to find her, you know, deceased, and on a day that she'd gone to ability in the morning, we. Ranches, not the donuts, you know, and all of this. Mm. Um, but like you said, in hindsight, that was a pretty good last day. You know, it's it's the best last day. You know, it was it was a normal day. It was a joyful day, um, and so forth. So, um, you know, even though I I didn't get the chance to to execute the plan or or what have you, it's still I think we can find, as you pointed out, Lori, those those joyful memories to give us strength and, and support. Mm-hmm. Right. So I want to talk about one other uh, emotion that I think pet owners whose, whose pet pets may feel, and I, I think that might be some embarrassment too, in that they're embarrassed to express their feelings, embarrassed to talk about it. Um, mm-hmm. I think about my mom, and uh, she she lost her husband. 
And they had gotten this Greyhound together when my mom had a heart attack and it was an incentive for her to get out and walk and so forth. So then Eddie became her guy, you know, after her husband had passed and then Eddie passed away and he was kind of known, this is a rural community in Iowa as, as the mayor, you know, because he was as big as a pony mm -hmm. and everybody, you know, recognized him. Greyhounds are not common in Jefferson. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, he died in the winter. Um, and in February and so there really wasn't this uh, way for my mom to communicate to people and I said well mom mm -hmm. why don't you put a like a, an obit in the paper you know and, and I'm, I'm happy uh -huh. to write it and Aww. but then she at first she was excited and then she's like oh that you know I'm, I'm embarrassed I don't want to do that um she didn't want to trivialize the obituaries of people um, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, she didn't have, have that kind of support. So, you know, I don't know. I just wanted to speak to that, you know, potential embarrassment and, and in expressing feelings and how much, um, you know, these pets mean to us. And, and then for those around her in this case, but, you know, anybody who loses a pet, you know, what are some right words, some things to say, um, you know, I realize I'm going on a soliloquy here, but you know, sometimes I think about you know, death and dying is it's almost like um, equivalent to like mental illness, and that you know, we're not supposed to talk about it in the shadows, you know. Mm -hmm. And finally, you know, mental illness is coming to the forefront, and and mm -hmm. not having that stigma around it, and um, you know, so. Shut up now, Lori. What, what say you? <laughs> no, no, no. No, I'm glad you brought that up because that permeates so much uh, of of the grieving process for so many people. I I do see that, and you know, I mean, in the in the larger scope, as you've said and indicated, it is part of. You know, we, we're in a culture that has trouble dealing with death and making space for it with integrating it into our lives. I mean, unless we're living on a farm or in a very, very extended family. Most of us are not up close in an integrated way with death and dying. And so, you know, I, like you say, there are some societal changes. I mean, now there are greeting cards for pet loss. So whatever mm -hmm. you think of that, it is, it is visibility and mm -hmm. so much about things being okay and being valued, right? It's about visibility. So that, that is an important step, but I could also understand, you know, your mother thinking, you know, because this is the world she lives in, like, oh, is that going to disrespect a human's death, mm -hmm. you know, and that there's still that kind of divide of who's most valuable, what relationships are most valuable, uh, you know, what's the hierarchy here. And, you know, I know someone who uh, needed to take time off of work when her dog died and filled out the form and, you know, wrote what she had to say to take her bereavement days for her dog, even though it wasn't legally allowed. Um, so, you know, I, I think we are up against the societal norms and that is changing, but I just think that, and that does exacerbate the pain sometimes of our losses. But what I find is that the bottom line is that people just want to be seen and valued in their love and in their loss. And they want to be heard. They want to be listened to. And, you know, I just think that people do say some really hurtful things, Some usually with the best of intentions, like, oh, you can adopt again, or when are you going to adopt, or things like that. And, you know, I think, unfortunately, as grievers, we have to see that, um, you know, it's awkward. People don't know what to say. And I think that's why if we have someone, whether it's a friend or a professional who can really listen to us and value our love and our loss, that that actually helps us heal. I thought you had a great idea, Chris, of writing an ob obituary and, yeah. and, you know, especially, you know, for the mayor, you know, and, yeah. and, but I could also understand like, you know, your mother being a little unsure because is this, is this important enough? You know, is this, is somebody going to say like, oh, how can you make that loss this important? And those are just, you know, it's not her 
individual questions. It's questions we have from what we've learned. And, and I find that part of the, um, you know, offering counseling is a little bit psychoeducation of, you know, the value, you know, knowing, validating in your mind what you're feeling in your heart, that this is a primary loss, that you need time and space to grieve, that it does help to memorialize. That's a whole other subject that, you know, we don't, with humans, if we want, we can, you know, pretty much mobilize a memorial service or a, you know, some something uh, that is that is more uh, normalized. And with animals, we have to create a memorial. Right. You know, I, I think the other thing that, is interesting to me is I think we often think of grief, you know, it's happening after death, but what clients often don't realize is, and I can see it happening to them in their caregiver fatigue is that they're starting to have this anticipatory or ant anticipating that grief. So can grief happen well before death arrives? Can that happen? Is that happening to this? It's what it seems like it's happening to clients sometimes. Yeah, sure. Sure. And you know, it could be as concrete as grieving, you know, not going for a hike anymore or grieving that they're not as cuddly or, you know, they don't want to chase the ball. They can't see the ball. Um, but it could also be us knowing what's coming, you know, and, and you know, really starting to grieve and mourn that, you know, their life is, towards its end. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I think another kind of uh, area that I'm hoping to give more visibility to is caregiver support, because I do think people that hasn't really been acknowledged as much as I feel like it needs to be. And sometimes that's really when people need you know, the most support uh, with all the decision making and all the changes and, you know, they're grieving, but they're also having to care for their beloved. Right. And, and often clients are often very surprised when I say, I think you're, you know, you might be experiencing some caregiver fatigue or some caregiver burnout. And uh -huh. again, I think there's a stigma on that because it's, you know, the dog or the cat, and it's not my mother or my grandmother, uh, but it's happening. Mm -hmm. and, and that, you're right, that's when they really need that support. And they may mm -hmm. not even realize it themselves that it, it's happening. But no, they don't. Sometimes yeah. they don't. Yeah. Right. So, so calling right. that out, and, and I think that, Kathy, you and I both have experienced this a lot, because your point, Lori, there isn't a place for people to go. And because there Kathy is. and I see our, our, pets and their owners on a very frequent basis, you know, we oftentimes by default become that counselor support system, um, whatever you want to call it, and we may not be the best qualified. And, and so that's why this talk is so exciting, you know, for yeah. the mm -hmm. need tools too, and, and ways to think about things and how we can all help all around so yeah and that, that there's a resource there's a, a good resource now now we have Lori we have mm -hmm. a great resource <laughs> thank you well I, I I can tell that you two do offer very good support but you know it's a team right we're all like this larger kind of care team and you know it, it really the more people can know that there's a network of us out here um i think the more it will ease their way yeah yeah and and like to your point chris and to understand that they shouldn't be embarrassed to reach out for support or help that that it's out there mm -hmm. and and people who need it should seek it yes. you know, mm -hmm. or maybe like, and some maybe we need to point it out sometimes too that that they're experiencing right. some caregiver you know burnout so they, because i often say to people you know you're trying so hard but unless you take care of yourself you're not going right. to be of help to you know your pet or your family so right. um you know you need to, to look out for yourself too and that's where that compassion fatigue and mm. exhaustion and stuff you know becomes a, a real burden yeah 
Right. It's the old airplane analogy that you have to put on your oxygen mask first before you put it on for right. a dependent to, right. to be able to right. take care of them. Right. Um, you know, and and sometimes, sometimes people who aren't familiar with counseling or just don't see the worth of it will say, well, I don't, I don't what would I say? And, you know, I just, tell that say do you have any stories about your dog and oh my goodness they have so many stories we have, we have you know, stories would you, <laughs> would you like to show me some pictures oh, i see videos you know yeah. and yeah. and then all that love and all that you know connection comes alive yeah 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 um and maybe they don't and maybe that's the opening the door for them to yeah. to start to talk about their their grief you know, in the room, you know? much, yeah, that they talk about how much they love their animal and how much they meant to them and what they did. And, um, and then they, you know, maybe can open the door up to, um, to talking about their loss. Um, you know, and mm -hmm. I, I want to ask you about this, Lori, because what I would say one of the most common questions I get after a pet has died is when should I get another pet, right? The, mm -hmm. the, the, they're worried about being disrespectful to the other pet, mm -hmm. the pet that's just died. Um, they're worried that the new pet might somehow feel like uh, a replacement and maybe that's not fair to the, mm -hmm. to the new pet. So there's a lot of emotion around when, when should I get, when is okay, when, when is the time? And my answer, you know, always is always, it depends on how you grieve. You know, for some people yeah. getting a new pet kind of gives them something positive to put their energy into. And for some people, they need more time to process. What are your thoughts mm -hmm. on that? Glad you brought that up. It reminds me of a client who um, had adopted a cat kind of by default. Um, it was later in his life. He had never lived with animals and he was taking care of it for the neighbor and then the neighbor was incapacitated and and then a couple of years later, the cat died and he, he found that he wanted to adopt again. And his question was, is this normal? And, you know, I agree. It, it is complicated. Um, but I think that, it, you know, there's no right or wrong. And I think that it's, it's natural to feel ambivalent. And I think that's important for people to know that. Usually it's not the case that you're going to wake up one morning and just feel like, okay, I'm 100% ready to adopt again, or, you know, that you're going to wait your whole life because you just don't feel quite ready. There is, you know, a natural ambivalence. And, and after I get to know people, I tell them that I feel confident that you have enough love in your heart to both love the one you have lost and to open your heart to somebody new. And there's so many, you know, cats and dogs and other animals out there who need homes and they would be so lucky to be uh, taken into your home. I, lo I love that statement, Lori, that there's enough, yes. there's enough room in your heart to lo love the pet that you lost and enough room to love a pet that might, a new pet that comes to you. That's great. Mm, thank you. I often say too that, you know, people are like, the pain, the pain at the end was so much, I can't go through that again. And then I try to get them to focus on all, again, those years of great memories. And I realize that people, you know, process differently and so forth. But that's always been my go-to. It's like, yes, the end sucks. We, you know, there's no doubt about it. Mm. But then when you start asking about, you know, those pictures and videos and, you know, vacations that you had together and all those, you know, memories that you shared, you know, I personally, I feel like that's worth it. That's worth the pain that I endure at the end because mm -hmm. they've given us so much through their life. Right. And I think with that, that is also the value of having some kind of uh, way to uh, memorialize the ones we've lost. I mean, it could be as simple as lighting a candle every night. It could be getting, you know, um, you know, a planting something. It could be writing a thank you letter to them. It could be gathering other people around. I mean, I just think that 
it helps at that hard time at the end to shape our feelings and almost kind of uh, release them. You know, it, it kind of gives them a little shape instead of just being stuck inside us of us, which it's so it get we it gets so heavy, and I think doing some kind of ritual can help move us to be able to see more of the whole life that we've had with them. So maybe you even write that obituary, even if you don't send it into the paper. You know, you just write it for yourself. Absolutely, you write it for yeah. yourself. Yeah. I did do that. Yeah. Exercise. I, I had written the obituary. I just hadn't hadn't sent it in on my mom's behalf. Um, that kind of, you know, I wanted to talk about the tremendous void that people feel, you know, once their, their pet passes, especially if they've had a lot of caregiving responsibilities at the end. You know, I remember my Hank that had cancer and, you know, I mean, every day I was going to the grocery store to buy different food to see if he would eat it. And, I, you know, the multiple appointments and just the observation of him, you know, being so vigilant. And then he passes and there's this huge void, you know, and you have all this time on your hands. But that kind of mm-hmm. you or know, people feedbacks. were checking in on yeah, or people were checking in on you to see how you were doing while you were taking care uh-huh. of your cat. And then once the cat passed, there's sort of like that day after Christmas, you know what I mean? That like oh, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. right. you know, that everybody goes away, right? Yeah. But to your point, Lori, with the memor- yeah. memorialization, I can't say that word. And the rituals and things, that may help with with some of that void too, because then you have a mm-hmm. A focus and um, you know, like to the time and the space, um, and you're using that in a productive way versus just feeling, you know, lost and empty. Right, and and it is sometimes people say, well, I could only you know work on a memory book five minutes a day. That's okay, you know, but it's keeping that thread going, um, you know. I think that it does help us connect to the love and it does show, you know, it, it does help bind that grief that, and like you say, that all that empty space, sometimes people will use the time that was say feeding time to work on a, uh, you know, some kind of uh, plan for a memorial um, sometimes people have taken like uh, that special spot by the window and, mm-hmm. you know, put a photograph. And uh, because the other thing with grieving is that we need to what they call relocate our loved ones. And I'm not talking about any particular spiritual or religious thinking. It's that, you know, our love and our relationship continue, right? We still love them. We miss them. That's a relationship that's love and so if we have a place or a way to reconnect with them whether it's that photograph or that spot by the window or that memory book or that those flowers growing outside it actually allows the love to kind of flow a little more easily and that does soothe the heartache yeah. I think you're right. I have a confession to make, and and I haven't told anybody this, so I'm I'm yeah. practicing what I preach. Mm-hmm. So uh, when I ended up taking Bagney to the emergency room, and I had to call home, and uh, my partner didn't pick up right away, and and, and that message is on our answering service, and I think uh, about uh-huh. six years, and. Uh-huh. I have not erased it yet because I still yeah. go back to that and I listen to it and go back to that time and, and the feelings that I had and so forth. But just recently I voiced this to Heidi. I said, I, I think I'm ready. I think we can, mm-hmm. we can erase it. So we haven't yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In through time. Yeah. But it's a process crazy. and Yeah. We got crazier than you, Chris. After we lost, um, after we lost Digger, we, um, my husband and I, decided, you know, we that's it. We're we're selling our house and we're going on a year long trip and we're going to go around the United States. And what we did was we took one of Digger's toys with him that looked like him, and he was flat, so we called him Flat Digger, like Flat Stanley. Ah, right? And we took <laughs> flat, and we took Flat Digger with us everywhere we went. We took him to Zion Aww. National Park. We took him to Key West. <laughs> we put him in our backpack. And it was our way of sort of like sharing this trip with him. Yeah. Um, and then when yeah. we got 
we got a new dog, there was a whole discussion because flat digger is a toy, a dog toy. There was a whole discussion about whether we let Mac, our new dog, have flat digger as a toy. Like we were so emotionally right. attached to flat digger. <laughs> and then at some point I was like, you know what? I'm ready. Flat digger is not a real dog. It's just a toy. And you know, we gave the Mac. Right. Uh, but it felt so good to have, uh, you know, this flat digger with us. Um, and I remember us hiking into, um, in Arizona and, and flat digger sort of sticking out the back of my husband's backpack. Right. And, and remembering that, <laughs> you know, that somehow we've, we've managed to bring him with us, you know, and that felt, yeah. really, it felt really good. That's an awesome yeah, story. Yeah. I mean, all those connections I think are really important and really natural. I mean, I think as humans, we need that, you know, what's concrete, you know, and it right. it helps us work things out and stay connected. And I still call Ellie's bed, Ellie's bed, even though Pearl sleeps in it and Ellie passed <laughs> on years ago, but it's still, and they knew Ellie's each bed. other. So, and she was the queen. So it's still Ellie's bed. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, <laughs> well, uh, I, I think I, a few things, well, a lot of things resonated with me, but uh, you know, as we wrap up the show, I think, you know, the power of starting that conversation by asking people to share memories and being a good listener. I don't think we have to have the right words. I don't think we have to know everything, but, but just listening, I think, has, has great value. And uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're all in this together. You know, we all experience mm -hmm. um, similar emotions, but yet different because all of our relationships were different with with our pets and and you know between each other as individuals as people but also you know how we grieve each pet is very unique and individualized and and so those were some of my takeaways what about you Kathy yeah I, I think that um, I think that being the good listener is 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 the key for at least in in you know, as, as my role as a veterinary technician or as my role as the caregiver of your pet is to, um, you know, to be a good listener. I don't want to minimize your grief. I know how painful it is. I've lost a dog. Um, and so I think, you know, and, and the resource, you know, having Lori to be able to really help these people through um, that part of the support that they need when their pet's at the end stage of their life and they're maybe having some caretaker fatigue and having someone there to talk to um, and have them listen, you know, and that about their their heartbreak of losing their pets so i think the listening listening is a good tool to have <laughs> mm -hmm. Lori, what about and you? it goes a long way it sounds so simple and you know we're all so busy but you know it's really you know it could be five minutes and if somebody really feels seen and valued and that their love and their loved one's life and passing is important you, you know you've given them so much that's what I strive for. That's what I'm striving for. And Lori, is there is there any other last uh, pearl of wisdom that you would like to share with our, our listeners? Hmm. Well, I guess I would say to try and be gentle on ourselves, um, you know, because, um, you know, so many people will say, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. And I say, you are getting through it, you know, and it, 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 it's important to be patient and, and also have healthy distraction. Just like we need sleep, we need distraction from grief, you know, a movie, a book that's easy to read, a jigsaw puzzle, you know, it's, it's really actually helpful um, to have distraction. Um, and, you know, to try and have some routines, it's so hard, especially when we're grieving. But even if it's going outside for five minutes every morning, just routines are grounding, and that's helpful. And to, again, be gentle on ourselves, like we have an open wound when we're mourning, and we would not ask somebody with serious burns to go on an exodus exercise program, you know? Right, um, right. So, you know, to have perspective on what's realistic right now and to care for ourselves and to care for our love for the one who's passed on. That's great. Perfect. Another, Another, thing. Yeah. Totally. Awesome. Cool. So in conclusion, where can people find you, Lori? Sure. Well, as I said, I'm part of the Sleepy Dog team, though I meet with people from all over. Uh, so people can contact me either through my 
phone number, which is 781-350-8219, or through my email, which is MissMyPets, and that's with an S at the end, at gmail.com. And I offer uh, phone and virtual sessions, and when it's not a pandemic, uh, in-person sessions, and uh, drop-in grief support group. I also offer sliding scale um, just to, you know, try and have this as accessible as possible to as many people. And we'll, we'll, put, that in our, we'll put that in our show notes for people, too, Absolutely. so that where they can find a reach, so they can reach Lori, okay? Yeah all of her contact information on where to find her. But I just want to emphasize that uh, just because you're here in Massachusetts, people can contact you by phone and set up virtual sessions from all over. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that has not been a barrier. And thanks to technology, we can do that phone and virtually. Um, and also, I want to add to that, that it doesn't have to be a recent loss. Sometimes it's a past loss that hasn't really been grieved or something new has brought it up to the forefront. So, um, you know, sometimes people come to me who are grieving a loss from many, many years ago. And that's just as important. Mm, good point. Good point. All right. Well, thank you, my friend. Great, thank great you. Uh, thank discussion you. today. All right. Take care. Okay. Thank, thank you both. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed our show. Follow us on Facebook or on Instagram at Petability Podcast. For more information about Kathy's books and living with blind dogs, please go to EnableYourPet.com. Thank you, and please tune in next time.